None of what I am about to say would have mattered if Britain had remained intact. It has not. The peripheral countries have devolved governments that will ultimately result in independence. Neither would it matter provided each country contributed towards the running of Britain and took proportionally the same out. They do not. British expenditure is heavily biased in favour of the peripheral countries and Scotland in particular. The political climate in this country is heavily biased towards the homeland of the Scots in Westminster. The blame for this situation must be directed at English politicians for allowing it and the English population for putting up with it rather than try to blame the people of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland for accepting it. However, they must realise that for all of the countries of the UK to enjoy the mutual benefits of close cooperation, it must be on a fair and equitable basis. Anything less will result in ill feeling and eventual disintegration of the UK with bitter feelings of resentment and that would play admirably into the hands of Europe. Tony Blair in his triumphant message to Donald Dewar in 1998 tried to imply that Scotland was equal to England. But that camouflages the fact that Scotland is effectively the same size as Yorkshire and Humber, an English county. Both have a population of 5 million people, but the funding of those 5 million Scots is a massive variance to that size relationship. The Barnet formula ensures that Scotland gets billions of pounds more than Yorkshire and Humber. It would be a mistake to think that the Barnet cash is the sole advantage that the Scots in Westminster bestow on their fellow countrymen. The hidden subsidies that are stealthily pushed over the border are of much more significance. It's easy to forget that Britain is financed by all British taxpayers and the English constitute 85% of the population of Britain and the Scots less than 10%. So the English taxpayer funds 85% of the running costs of both England and Scotland. And in theory, the Scots contribute 10%. But this is now where it gets rather murky. One provision of the Barnet formula allocates Scotland 10% of the cost of all capital projects carried out in England. Now let that sink in. They are compensated for any project that is carried out in England to the tune of 10% of the total cost of that project. It works like this. Let us suppose that the high speed rail link between Birmingham and London costs £20 billion. Now pro rata that would be £18 billion from the 50 million English and £2 billion pounds from the 5 million Scots. But then, for no justifiable reason whatsoever, the Scots will get handy 10% of the total cost of the project, £2 billion. Pounds. Thus, the rail link would cost the English taxpayers not £18 billion, but the whole £20 billion, because they have to deposit £2 billion into the outstretched hand of Scotland. Scotland's taxpayers will in effect contribute nothing. So the English fund 85% of the cost of Scottish capital spending and 100% of all English projects. Now were the same project carried out in Scotland, the English taxpayer would provide the £18 billion and the Scots would provide £2 billion. Thus the Scots get a £20 billion system for £2 billion one-tenth of the cost. The fourth bridge replacement is being rushed through at an estimated cost of £9 billion. The Scots will pay a maximum of £1 billion. The £4 billion order to Strathclyde shipyards for two Royal Navy ships is paid by the British government. The Falkirk wheel cost £250 million. The Scots paid £25 million for an asset that attracts countless thousands of tourists every year. The 10% cash bonus they get on all capital projects carried out in England, such as the proposed new high-speed rail link between Birmingham and London, the new runway at Heathrow and the new London transport system, will net them tens of billions of pounds. The London Olympics alone will net them about two billion pounds for no reason whatsoever. The money is a free gift for no obvious reason. 
If we analyse it proportionally, like for like, it is out and out robbery. Let us suppose that a project costing £500 million is carried out in England. With a population of 50 million people, that is £10 for each person. England has to give Scotland 10% of the cost of that project, £50 million. Now with a population of 5 million, the Scots get the same £10 each. So we have to pay 110% of the cost of every project carried out in England in order to provide the same thing free of charge for the Scots. This is the British dividend at its most lucrative and never forget that we're talking of a region of 5 million people. Scotland is already much better off than England in terms of expenditure and funding so in effect it makes the proud people of Scotland a nation of benefit cheats. Can you now see why the Scots will not vote for independence? They can't afford to. It is strange indeed how our prudent Prime Minister can always seem to conjure a profit in his homeland and is totally incompetent in his administration of the English economy. State spending in Scotland is 52% of the national economy. That's the highest rate of any country in the developed world save Sweden, Denmark and France. But the tax revenue shows that Scotland has the seventh lowest tax take among the world's 30 most developed nations. 52% of all Scottish employment is in the public sector and 40% of the population are claiming benefits. 85% of all of this is paid by us English, as will be the massive index linked pensions for those public sector workers and that we have to pay them for life. As you see, whilst they appear to contribute 10%, they get many times that back. It is the only way that they can maintain their profligate living standards that us English can only dream of. Now you see why we English need Scotland to be self-financing. We cannot afford the luxury of such expensive neighbours. We're not asking any favours of them, we just need them to start paying for their own keep. They will hang on to the Union as long as they possibly can and that is one reason that they constantly use their position in Westminster to block a Parliament for England whilst fighting tooth and nail to secure the one they've got in their homeland. The Scots have advantages enjoyed by no other country on earth. They are basically funded by another country that appears powerless to stop them. We need to recognise that Brown, Cameron, Clegg Griffin and Farage all want this to continue. They're unionists and are prepared to rob the English to finance it. We have 560 English constituency MPs doing nothing about it. Ask yourself, do you know of one Scottish, Welsh or Irish MP that deliberately works against his own people? England has over 500 of them. Our only salvation will be a party with an agenda for an English parliament. There's only one, and it's growing very rapidly. Now, I think that the people of Scotland must realise that whilst this appears good for them in the short term, the resultant English resentment will ensure that Scotland will not prosper long term. Even they must recognise the inevitability of an English Parliament once the English masses turn their current irritability into full-blown fury. And that time is not far away.